Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 12.1. Before we get there, are you a Bible believer? We're doing the next series here called Pre-Trib Rapture or Day of Christ. Now remember, this whole series was about are you infected with the yea hath God said a better render would be disease, where you claim to be a Bible believer. Okay. Proverbs 36 said, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Some of the greatest men that I have followed have used this verse, said this book is perfect from cover to cover, and yet they all are guilty of adding to this book somewhere or subtracting from this book somewhere. And when you call them out for it, they say, Well, you know, we, don't, we use lots of words that aren't in the Bible. And they try to use uh, debating tactics or argument tactics like saying, Well, I, I used to, I've said this before, I use the word microwave, but I never say, thus saith the Lord microwave, thus saith the Lord computer, thus saith the Lord automobile, thus saith the Lord whatever. Okay, when it comes to technology, when it comes to different words, we can use any word when it comes to our day-to-day -day life, whether it's just Christ to a point, you know, don't use cuss words, foul language. Um, and be careful with your words, you know, because the Bible talks about uh, trying to, we're not to damn people to hell. Okay, that's God going to do that. That's God's place. Um, we got to be careful with our words. Don't get me wrong. Don't say I'm, I'm not opening up a license to say whatever and whatever. But I'm saying there's a lot of words that we use that aren't in the Bible. Yes, that's true. And they'll try to use that argument. But when you sit there and say, thus saith the Lord, the best example, and I don't have this turned to it, but the Bereans. When Paul went to talk to the Bereans, he said, thus saith the Lord. What did the Bereans do? Oh, there's words that we use that aren't in the, in the scriptures. There's words that we... They search the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So when someone says, this is major doctrine, this is fundamental, fundamentals of the faith, and we can't find it in there, we're to look at them and go, hey, chapter and verse. Now, one of the first things they like to hit us with, brothers and Christ, is, they that are of God heareth God's words. He, he therefore hear them not because you're not of God. Um, I remember Peter Ruppin used to say that a lot. And he'd also say it about things that weren't in the Bible. Okay? Like what we're going to be talking about today. He would say pre-trib rapture. Okay? Chapter and verse where it says pre-trib rapture. They that have God here with God's word. How can I hear his words that aren't even in here? Now what that's talking about, that verse is talking about, is someone can read this book. Someone can have head knowledge. Someone can pair it with somebody else teaches. Absolutely. But it's never going to make its way here without the Holy Spirit. They that are of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because you're not of God. The people I'm talking to and really kicking today, they're not going to hear what I have to say because they're not of God and they don't want the truth. Some of you are going to be fighting it because you've been taught to use words outside the Bible and it's okay. It's okay. You know, indoctrination. You've been indoctrinated with using words and phrases and descriptions and titles that aren't in the Bible. So what we're talking about today is pre-trib rapture or day of Christ. Okay. Pre-trib, of course, is not in there. Okay. Tribulation we're going to get to a little bit later. But we're going to hit the word rapture first. Okay. I looked, so for first Proverbs 36 we read that. And thou add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. What we're seeing here in the body of Christ is we're so infected with that disease of, yea, God said, a better rendering would be, that we're adding to God's word all the time. And I threw myself in there because I'm going to be kicking myself in here because notice I said pre-trib rapture or the day of Christ, not the catching pre-time, catching away the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. The actual title for that, for that event where we get caught up is the day of Christ. I'm guilty. I hardly ever say day of Christ. I'm always say, trying to say, well, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, making this long thing. It's like, that's, that's okay. It's a description. But the actual title is day of Christ. I'm guilty of adding to the word of God. I try to change the title that God set up for man's titles. I'm trying to get away from that faulty title, pre-trib pre rapture. But at the same time, I'm not turning back to God's word and saying it God's way. We're going to get into that. Romans 3, 4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. In these studies that we've been doing, Brother Jesus Christ, we've been showing that if you say things God's way, 100% God's way, God's definitions, God's titles, God's words, usually it's so easy to debunk all these false teachings. 
just like that. They're liars. They're wrong. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Are you following this book when thou art judged? Are we following this book? I'm guilty in certain areas where I'm not following this book. And I believe so are you, brother Jesus Christ. What, what do we do? We work hard. Sanctification. We work hard to study the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study the Word. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. That thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome them when thou art judged, not be ashamed. When we find out that we're doing something that isn't right, we correct it, and we get back on the right path. We don't fight it, even though some of us do. Right? We're not supposed to just give up, which some of us do. We're supposed to keep fighting for the truth and for what is right. And we realize that when we're not fighting for the truth or we're not doing something right, we need to repent, forsake, and get back to being right with God. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and come after me. Okay. That's the life of a Christian. But lately it just seems like brethren are really fighting everything. So let's start with rapture. Okay. I've got a video, I'll put the link at the bottom. I've got a video where we did it where we did more of a drawing up there, a stick figuring drawing, talking about it. But first I want to say rapture. Look it up in the Bible, the concordance. Once, minute, once again, we're getting out our concordance to find out chapter and verse. Zero scripture reference. Why? Because the word rapture is not in the Holy Scriptures. It's not in the Bible, Holy Scriptures that are found in the King James Bible. The God's perfect written word of God. So make sure you get this out. Okay? It's not in there. But there's so many people who say, rapture, we're, we're, we believe in the rapture, and we believe the rapture is coming soon. Oh no, we believe the rapture is halfway through the great tribulation, which we already talked about, which is the time of Jacob's trouble. It's halfway through the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh no, we believe it's the rapture is at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Rapture, rapture, you hear it all the time. Rapture, rapture. I've heard great men of God repeat, rapture, rapture, rapture. And when you ask them chapter and verse on the word rapture, it's not in the Bible. And after we go through this definition, when people ask me, do you believe in the rapture? I tell them no. Now at first they think I don't believe in any, that there's no catching away the body of Christ, but they just, because they're brainwashed, thinking that's what rapture is. It isn't. Here's the definition of Webster's 18, or 19, I think I put it in wrong, 1828 dictionary. First, uh, uh, definition number one, a seizing by violence. That's not what's going to happen. What about definition number two? Transport, ecstasy, violence of a pleasing nature, passion, extreme joy, or pleasure. That's not what's going to happen either. There's no violence involved. We've talked about that in my old study. A man's walking along, he trips over a rock, there's a pit there, and God says, you're not falling into that pit, and he catches that man and catches him up, caught up. The rock is the event where Satan's kicked out of heaven. The pit is the time of Jacob's trouble. The man is the body of Christ. The body of Christ trips over the rock. And God goes, you're not going into that time period. And we get caught up. And it's a wonderful thing. We're looking for it. The Bible says we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. It's a hope. It's a great thing that's going to happen. We all want it to happen. We're supposed to be looking for it. It's not about violence. Of a pleasing nature. Verse 3. Repetitive, repetitive with violence, a hurrying along with velocity, a rolling with torrent rapture. That isn't it either. Fourth, enthusiasm, uncommon heat of imagination. So it's just an imagination, you know, us being caught up, it's just imagination. But these are the definitions. Now one thing I'd ask for the brethren, I didn't really do the study on this, is where did the word rapture ever come from? I can, tell you, I can tell you the most general point. It's man's terms. It's man's wisdom. It came from man. It didn't come from God. It didn't come from the Word. It didn't come from the Holy Spirit. But honestly, in the history of man, when did the rapture come in and they kicked out day of Christ? It was always, when you read the Bible, we're going to get into it. Day of Christ. Day of Christ. Day of Christ. Caught up. Come up hither. Nowhere was it ever called rapture. When did that come in where Satan infiltrated and got people to turn their back on what God said for what man says? Just something to throw out there so maybe someone knows a little bit more about that. Okay, 
Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Like I said, it's man's wisdom. I know that much. Rapture isn't, doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from man. It's a man's term. It's a man's word. It's man's philosophy. It's man's wisdom. And we're commanded in Colossians 2.8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Once again, what did we read up there? Add thou not to his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. Okay. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. And I've always said this time and time again, when you start getting into the traditions of men, culture, it's always going to wind up going against this book. Okay. The ways of the world, the rudiments of the world, are always going to be contrary to this book. They're always going to be trying to go against it. Okay. So hopefully you have your Bible turned to 2 Corinthians 12.1. We're going to start with caught up, taken up, come up hither. Okay. They want to say rapture, but remember, they're using rapture as a title, but then there's times they'll say it's just a description of what's going to happen. Well, we read the definition of rapture. That's not what's going to happen. What's actually going to happen is, is you have caught up. When people go up to heaven, God has to grab, uh, to pick them up and carry them up. I mean, you go, to, I don't have this in my notes, but you go to Elijah. Did Elijah just, I'm going to heaven and go up of his own accord? <clears throat> no, the chariot came and picked him up. God sent something that was his to grab him. God grabbed him and pulled him up. Okay? Man can't make it to heaven on their own, no matter how much people try. But caught up, 2 Corinthians 12.1. We're doing a word study a little bit, then some subject studies, and we're going to get into some topics. This is going to be a little bit longer video than I intended it, because I started going to really making some points that I thought was important to separate and make a distinction between things. So 2 Corinthians 12.1. 2 Corinthians 12.1. We read, It is not expedient for me to doubt to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Some people believe this is Paul talking about himself, but he's talking about himself in the third person. Or he could be talking about somebody else. I'm not going to add the scriptures and say it's 100% this is Paul. Just some of us believe it's Paul. But let's keep going. Such a one caught up. It doesn't say rapture. It says caught up. To the third heaven. Now what does it mean by caught? Once again, one thing I hardly ever say, I always use it in, 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 the, in the context of the catching away of the body of Christ. Going in, we're not going into the time of Jacob's trouble. But in this context here, it's talking about when someone dies that believes in Jesus Christ, that's washed in his blood, that is sealed into the day of redemption. When they die, oh, they're about to go to hell. And God goes, no. Jesus goes, no, he's mine. He's mine. My blood washed his sins away. And he catches them before he can go to hell and catches them up. That's what we're reading here. Such as one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise. And we did a study on this. The word paradise has talked about heaven. Okay. When Jesus is on the cross with the thief there, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. They say, well, he went to Abraham's bosom with, with Jesus. No, he went to heaven. Okay, That's paradise. Abraham's bosom is, is called a prison. We've proven this in the scriptures. It's a prison where the Old Testament saints would had to go into waiting before they could go up. They needed Jesus Christ's blood, the perfect sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice before they could go up. The blood of the Old Testament only covered their sins. I don't want to get into that too much, but paradise. It's heaven. And once again, he had to be caught up. He, we can't go to heaven on our own. Somebody has to take us there. And today it's Jesus Christ. Caught up into paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Verse 5. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. So we see the word caught up, and it's paradise. Heaven. 
What happens at the cat at the the day of Christ? That blessed hope. We get caught up to heaven. Who catches us up? God does. Because we can't make it up there on our own. God catches us up. Right? So we see caught up, not rapture. If there's no violence involved. Where does he mention violence where he, the man that's getting caught up is scared to death and he doesn't want to go? That's not there. He's caught up into paradise. Take me, Lord Jesus. How many of us are always like, even though you use the word rapture, misuse the word rapture, you're always like, please, Lord, come. How many times say, even so, come, Lord. We're looking for you to come back any day now, Lord. And I am too. And a lot of the brethren have taken their eyes off Jesus Christ's coming. And it, their lives reflect on it because they've taken their eyes off of it. They no longer believe that Jesus can come back any day now. That the day of Christ is at hand. Day of Christ. That's the body of Christ, the bride of Christ getting caught up. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Go to another time where it's being used. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up. We're caught. But people think we're caught in the sense that, like an animal, she's scared to death, we're caught. when you catch a wild animal. No. What it means by caught means is it has to do with falling. When someone's falling, you catch them. Someone tosses you an apple, you catch the apple before it touches the ground. Okay? Falling. That's what this caught is talking about. Okay, we're falling into something we're not supposed to go through, and God goes, you're not going through it, and he catches us. When you die, you know, when they, have you ever heard that statement, this, the man has fallen in battle? What's fallen me? They've died. Now, where are they going to go? God could either send them to hell, let them continue falling all the way down to hell, because they deserve to be there, or God can go, hey, and catch you up. Right. But this is talking about, I believe, the, the day of Christ. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Not only will we be caught up, but we'll be caught up together. It's not a one person and an individual event for each person. We're going to change. We're each going to hear our, our body's going to change. We're going to hear our names being called. But it's an event that's for all of us together. The bride of Christ, the body of Christ, we're all going. Nobody's getting left behind as far as the body of Christ. The lost world, false converts, they'll get left behind. Uh, Revelations 12.5, turn to Revelation 12.5. In Revelation... Revelation 12, verse 5, we read, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child... It's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, remember, we're going to get into this a little bit. Capital S, Son of Man, and capital S, Son of God. Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. That's who Jesus was. He was God the Father manifest in the flesh. He was also from the lineage of King David. That's what the capital S, Son of Man is. Okay? But her child, it's talking about Jesus Christ, was caught up unto God and to his throne. He's seated at the right hand of God. And what is this talking about? Well, you get into, I think it's Acts 1, where it shows that a cloud forms underneath Jesus' feet, and he goes up. He gets caught up. And even Jesus gets caught up. But you see there, he's caught, and he's, he's taken up. Was there any violence? When you read about that in Acts chapter 1, was there any violence involved? No. He says, I, 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 if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. In the sense of where we get the Holy, how we get the Holy Spirit today. They got the Holy Spirit in the, Old, in the Old Testament, but the Holy Spirit would come and go. It was just for an event. It'd come and go. Or it, you could lose it. It would come and stay as long as you did right, and God could take it away. That's where you got King David claiming, hey, don't take the Holy Spirit from me, Lord. Thy Holy Spirit from me. Yeah. Jesus said, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit can't come. The Comforter where the Holy Spirit comes in and it stays. It's there to stay for people who get saved. You're sealed into the day of redemption. That's only for this uh, dispensation. Right? The time of the Gentiles. 
Acts 1 1. Acts 1 1. We're going to start reading a little bit faster instead of turning, because I'm slow turning. We've got a lot to get through. This is just the first page out of five. Acts 1 1. The former trees have I made, O Theopolis. Remember, you can pause and turn and then unpause. O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. So there you see it saying taken up. Over here it says caught up and then taken up. God took him and brought him up. After that, he, and after that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. There's Acts 1.1. Okay. So, brothers of Christ, caught up, we have caught up, we have taken up. Acts 1.9, when you get to Acts 1.9, it says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. There we get the cloud. The cloud received him out of their sight. That's why I talk about when we get caught up, I believe everyone's going to, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, this corruption must put on incorruption. This moral must put on immortality. That's what happens in a moment, in a, tw in a blink of an eye, twinkling of an eye. That's instant. And then we're going to hear our names called. Philip Newton, come up hither. We get that in Revelation with John. John, come up hither. Philip Newton, come up hither. And then a cloud's going to form under all our feet, just like it did with Jesus, and we're going to go up. I always go back to... Um, I always get them mixed up because there's two of them. Uh, but he was, uh, the prophet um, was caught up in the, with a, the fiery uh, chariot, and the guy that was with him said, Hey, I'd like to see. And he's like, Oh, no, he asked for a double portion of thy spirit. And he says, If you see me ascend up, then God will grant thy request. So when he got to see there was a fiery chariot, there's always something that catches somebody up. They don't just go one minute they're here, the next minute they're in heaven. And that's what they're trying to push with this false rapture. Not all the people who say rapture believe this, but they believe that in the moment of the twinkle of eye, you just disappear and you reappear in heaven, boom, you're just there. It's like everywhere in the Bible when someone's caught up, except for... Um, my brain is sometimes will freeze on names, so please forgive me. Elijah. That's the one I was wanting to talk about. Elijah was the one about the fiery chariots came and picked up Elijah. Okay. But someone got to see it. The only thing is, is they would go back to Enoch. Okay, I believe that if someone was able to see something, they would have saw something pick up Enoch. A fire chair pike grabbed Enoch, just like it did Elijah, and took Enoch up. But there was no one there to see it. Okay, he just said he was he was not there for it. Because if no one was there to see it, to everyone else it was like he just he's gone. He's gone. But everywhere we read in the Bible, when you compare Scripture to Scripture, you're taken up, and it takes God taking you up. And sometimes there's, uh, when there's someone there to see it, there's something that takes you up. A cloud, a fiery chariot. But in, in all, when you get back to the, the foundation of it, it's God taking you up. You can't go up on your own. Uh, Revelations 4.1 Revelation 4 1. After this I took, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard were as of a trumpet talking with me, this is John, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now here's a key part here, because there's some brethren that were teaching that John got cut up, caught up permanently. And I was like, uh, God, how can he get caught up permanently when he wasn't caught up fully and completely? And you say, well, what are you talking about, brother? Read verse 2. And immediately, I was in the spirit. He got caught up spiritually, not physically. His body was still down here with a pen in hand, writing down everything that he saw up there. He got caught up in the spirit. He wasn't fully caught up, body, soul, and spirit. Okay? I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. That's how you know he was caught up to heaven. But here you see it come up hither. The word rapture is never used, brother says Christ. And people say, oh, you're nitpicking, you're nitpicking. Yea, let God be true. Let God be true. And let every man be a liar. I'll use me an example. Every man be a liar. When I used to say rapture, when I used to say pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, trying to use it as a title, not a description, but a title. Okay? 
Let man be a liar and let God be true. How does God say it? We're going to get into that. How does God say it? He doesn't say rapture. He says caught up, taken up, right? come up hither. These are the three terms that he uses when it comes to taking people to heaven. We need to line up with the book, brothers and Christ. Now, part of me wanted to end there, but then we got into, I put it the title, Day of Christ. So we got to start talking about the Day of Christ. But before we do, I'm going to start grabbing some things that we try to use as a title, even though the Bible says it, but it's more of a description of what the Day of Christ is, not an actual title. Uh, the Blessed Hope. How many times you hear us call it? I call it that blessed hope. All right. That blessed hope is good. All right. Turn to Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's the key. That's, what it, that's the definition of this next part. Verse 13. Looking. Just saying, oh, I just want Jesus to come back today to solve all my problems. That's not what the catching away of the body of Christ, that's not what the day of Christ is about. The day of Christ is not about solving all your problems. You're supposed to be looking for it and asking God to help clean up your life now and get your heart right with the Lord now and doing things right now. What the day of Christ is supposed to do is, uh, Paul says, that he might redeem us from this wicked world. It's to get us away from this wicked world and how bad things are as we're getting closer to the time of Jacob's trouble, and the Antichrist spirit is being prepared today. You read that in the book of John, 1 John. The Antichrist spirit is being prepared today, and things are getting worse and worse out there, and our vexation and the persecution and the tribulation that we're going through today, not, the, not great tribulation, in those days there shall be great tribulation, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the tribulations and the hardships we're going through today, God will save us from that, absolutely. But there's a lot of brethren that, I remember Peter Ruckman used to teach this, that when you're going, you've made a huge wreck of your life, well, just look for the blessed hope. We just read the definition of looking for the blessed hope. Peter Ruckman got that wrong. The blessed hope isn't supposed to solve all your problems that you keep causing, brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to get your heart right with the Lord. You need to get back in this book. You need to get back into prayer. You need to get back into reading this book, studying this book, and living this book. You need to make some changes in your life. To lie and make sure that those changes line up with the Lord. Continuing in wickedness and sin and doing things the wrong way and they're just saying, well, I'm just looking for the blessed hope. No, you're not. That's the opposite of looking for the blessed hope. Sorry to go off on that tangent a little bit, but that's the opposite of looking. If you're truly looking, you can always tell who's truly looking for that blessed hope and who's not. And a lot of some brethren that get called out on it, they've gotten to the point where they've turned their back on the eminent, what we call the eminent return of Jesus Christ. When it says the day of Christ is at hand, what at hand means is that at any moment, he can come back at any moment. Are you ready? Some brethren just flat out turned on it. Well, I still believe the body of Christ goes before the time of Jacob's trouble, but, but I no longer believe it's supposed, it was, it was going to happen, that Paul was looking for it, in other words. Uh, we can look back and say 2,000 years God didn't come back. Looking for the blessed hope isn't about looking back. Looking for the blessed hope has to do with looking forward. Paul was looking forward and his time period. He didn't know when Jesus was going to come back and call his bride home. And he was looking forward with the life that he was living. And he commanded everyone to do that. And some brethren aren't. But it says looking for that Blessed hope. Notice it doesn't say the blessed hope. That blessed hope. What's that blessed hope? The day of Christ. That blessed hope. What's the day of Christ? It's a hope and it's a blessed hope. Not just any hope because we've got lots of hopes. Okay? But a blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of our great side. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior. Jesus Christ who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Might? Notice the use of the word might. Is he saying that there's some, sin, some iniquity that he won't redeem? No, he's going to redeem us from all iniquity. We read that in other verses. But what's the might here? He's talking about it could happen in our lifetime. We're supposed to look for it. It might happen in our lifetime. But you still have brethren that turn their back on it. 
Why? Because they get too focused on the world. They take their eyes off Jesus Christ and they put it on the world. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. If you're truly looking for that blessed hope, good works are going to follow. Your life is going to reflect that you're looking for that blessed hope. I knew great men of God that turned their back on looking for that blessed hope and now they don't have good, they're not zealous of good works. They're too distracted by the world and worldliness. Culture. Verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. And I will continue to rebuke anybody that says, I believe we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. However, I don't believe in, that Jesus could come back any day now. They both go hand in hand. If you are not looking present tense for that blessed hope, he could come back any day now, then you're not really believing in it here. You got the head knowledge, but you're turning your back on it here. Okay, it's that simple. You have the head knowledge. Oh, we, we're, the body of Christ is supposed to go before the time of Jacob's trouble. The day of Christ happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. But do you really believe it? Because true belief, true faith, is backed by good works. You learn you learn that in James. Okay, I understand these are books for the time of Jacob's for the Jews going into the time of Jacob's trouble. But we learn things in, in Hebrews. We learn about when the New Testament comes in at the death of the testator. Okay, you can still learn things from these books. It we always talk about Abraham's faith was accounted to him for righteousness, but you learn in James, I think it is, where it talks about his faith without works is dead being alone. His faith was backed by his works. He actually took his son up there and was actually about to physically sacrifice him. He believed that God would provide himself a lamb, but until he did, he was going to obey God and do what God told him to do. It was works that backed up his faith. Okay. If you're truly believing in the day of Christ, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of Christ, then you're looking for it every day with the life that you're living. And there's people that aren't. That blessed hope, not the blessed hope, that blessed hope, we, we, there's all kinds of hopes that we have today. Lord, get me out of this trouble. Lord, protect me. Lord, that we have all these hopes. Okay. But he, when it says that blessed hope, it singles out that hope from all the other hope. It's a specific hope. What's that specific hope? The day of Christ. Okay. Jeremiah 17.7. 7. Turn to Jeremiah 17.7. 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. There's many hopes, brother says Christ, there's many hopes. Now calling it the blessed hope as a title, or the rapture as a title, is wrong. I've been guilty of this, sometimes I'll say that. But remember, you can say that blessed hope, the day of Christ. But the title is the day of Christ, we're going to get into it and prove it. Once again, the rapture makes it out to be just one and a title. There is a catching up when Jesus went out and the Old Testament saints. There will be one at the day of Christ. There will be one at the time of Jacob's trouble. The parts to one full catching away. In other words, in my notes, I'm just reading my notes. What it's saying is when Jesus had talked about there was people raised from the dead uh, when Jesus was resurrected, okay, that he went down, uh, that his soul, we did a study on this, Jesus' soul. Who's Jesus' soul? God the Father. So God the Father went down to Abraham's bosom and freed the captives there and took them up to heaven. That's the first part of the, of the catching away. Okay? That's the first part. There's a catching away that's called the day of Christ. That's for the bride of Christ. There's going to be a catching away in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going to have the two witnesses. This is the biggest evidence. The two witnesses are going to be beheaded. For I think three days, three or four days, and then they're going to be raised up, back to brought back to life, and then they're going to be caught up in front of everybody. Okay, there's going to be a catching away in three different parts of the Bible. We can read it, All right? But when you say the rapture, you're saying there's only one. So it can't. And when you read about it, the people being caught up in the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh, see, the body of Christ has to go through it because there's only one. There's no the rapture. There's no the blessed hope. It's that blessed hope. It's talking about a, it's singling out a specific blessed hope that's just for the body of Christ. It happens on the day of Christ. Okay. 
Proverbs 36 says, at, I'm going to read it again, Add thou unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Like I said, the rapture makes it out like there's only one, and it creates false teachings. We have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. No, we don't. Okay? And it never says the blessed hope. It's that blessed hope. Meaning there's, there's more than one hope. And we read about hope. I could have done a whole, we could have gone for another hour or two on hope in the Bible about different hopes and different time periods. That hope is in God. And God gives us hope. Okay? So when it says that blessed hope, it's singling out a hope apart from all other hopes. And then Romans 3, 4, God, God forbid, yea, let God be true, let every man be a liar. Like I said, when you actually stick with how the Bible says something, it, it, it dis this, this, I believe 100%. When I've had brethren that taught me that said, the Bible can defend itself. If you actually follow it, okay? The Bible can take care of itself. You read it as it says things, and it, it'll debunk everything. You need the Holy Spirit. They that are of God here, God's words, you need the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. But the Bible can debunk things when you just follow it. Add thou not unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Now, you've heard me say, day of Christ, over and over and over. So where did I get that? Where did I get day of Christ? It's, it's not in the Bible, is it? Turn to Philippians. Turn to Philippians. Philippians 1.6. You know, three out of the four times you see you have Day of Christ, it's mentioned in Philippians. And we've talked about this before, brothers of Christ. The time of, of, of the Gentiles is mentioned by Jesus Christ once. The, the time of Jacob's trouble, the actual title for that seven-year time period, is mentioned once. Okay? Just because something's mentioned once... Twice, three or four times. Why isn't it mentioned 50 million times? Why isn't it mentioned every time it's talked about? Any time it's talking about the day of Christ, it doesn't say day of Christ. Okay? We read some already. People always say, we just need a title. And if it calls it the day of Christ once, that's all that matters. If it calls it, calls it the, day, the time of Jacob's trouble, that seven-year time period, that's all that matters. Okay? But here, God gives us four times. Not just once, four times. Philippians 1.6. Well, actually you could say three. I kind of I threw this fourth one. We're going to do this first one. Flip, I just wanted to go in order. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you. Who's the you? The body of Christ. The individual Christian. You know, Chris, Christ in Christ. That's what Christian is supposed to mean. We did a whole study on this. In Christ. Okay. A good work in you, the bride of Christ will perform it until the day of Christ. Until. That means there's a stopping point. What's that stopping point? The day of redemption. You are sealed into the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? The day of Christ. This says the day of, the, of Jesus Christ. Turn to, uh, stay in this chapter 1, go down to verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense, till... The day of Christ. Now the way we're reading this in Philippians is that we're being told by Paul that you're supposed to look for that blessed hope until it happens. Until you get caught up in death or you get caught up in life and it actually happens, you're to look for it until. Now everybody back then didn't live all the way up to the, to the day of Christ. But at the time that he's saying this to those body of Christ, to those brethren that he's writing this letter to, to the Philipp um, Philippians, it's present tense. They're alive right then. Anybody who reads this present tense, like today, you're alive. Present tense. You're supposed to approve all things and be excellent that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Once again, we're supposed to be looking for it. Paul was looking for it. All the brethren from Paul up until now, they're all supposed to be looking for it, and a lot of them were, with the life that they're living. You're supposed to be looking for it. But here's the first time you see it say the day of Christ without saying Jesus Christ. It just says the day of Christ. The, remember there's the in the middle, uh, before it. The day of Christ. Philippians 2.16, flip over a chapter. 2.16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. 
Now people, how do I say this? People said Peter Ruckman when he was dying that he was crying because he, was, he didn't get to see the catching away of the body of Christ. The day of Christ. Okay, that blessed hope, which is the day of Christ. But here's the thing, he's still going to see it. And I keep pointing this out. I don't know why. He, 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 would, he would probably acknowledge it, but maybe he wanted to be alive for it. Maybe that's what it was. He wanted to be alive for it. But brothers says Christ, the dead in Christ shall rise first. We're all going to get to see it. We're all going to get to be there. Paul's going to be there. Peter's going to be there. John's going to be there. Titus is going to be there. Silas is going to be there. Timothy's going to be there. Okay, We're all going to be there. Okay? We're all going to get to see it. But there you see the day of Christ. It's talking about being caught up. We're sealed until the day of redemption. Remember that. Uh, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. What's that day of redemption? When God calls us home, calls us up, gives us new bodies. So when this says until, we're only supposed to perform a good work until we get caught up and then we start a whole new, I call it adventure, we start a whole new adventure with the Lord. Okay. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. This is the controversial one. People like to change this one from day of Christ to the day of the Lord because they need the Holy Spirit and they need to trust God. God didn't call it the day of the Lord. He called it the day of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. That ye be not soon shaken in mind. Who's the ye? The body of Christ. Or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us. Was the trouble part? People are telling them that they have missed the day of Christ, that they got left behind. As that the day of Christ is at hand. It hasn't happened yet, is what Paul's saying. It's at hand. It hasn't happened yet, though. Don't be deceived. Right? And we did a whole study on that, okay, proving that that whole chapter is talking about there's two events that's got to take place and they go hand in hand. When Satan gets kicked out, that's, that's what starts the two events. When Satan gets kicked out of heaven, the body of Christ has to be caught up, and the man's sin has to be revealed. There are two events that happen at the same time. You can't have one without the other. If someone says we, that there was a catching away in the past, people were caught up in the past, but the man's sin is yet to be revealed, they're liars as far as the body of Christ. Yes, the Old Testament saints were caught up, but I'm talking about when it comes to the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, you have false religions out there saying that there was a catching away in the past. Go ahead. I think it was like 1800 or something like that. It's like, uh, no, the man of sin hasn't been revealed. Oh, the, 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 the great tribulation hasn't happened yet. The man of sin hasn't been revealed yet. They're liars. You've got people teaching that the man of sin is going to be revealed and the body of Christ is going to still be here. The time of Jacob's trouble. That seven year time period. The man of sin gets revealed at the beginning and he starts his ministry, the ministry of Satan, for seven years. Right? They're teaching that the body of Christ goes into it. They're liars. You can't have one without the other. Okay? But it calls it the day of Christ. The day of Christ is at hand. And people will always say, well, Paul really missed this. What? Why can't you just take it for what it actually says? The day of Christ is at hand. And neither by spirit, the shaken in mind and soon troubled, as you have people telling them that they've missed it. It already happened. They missed it. And Paul's like, no, it's still at hand. It hasn't happened yet. And then he goes through that whole chapter and explains the two events. Us being caught up, the man of sin being revealed. And they both have to happen. You can't have one without the other. We are keeping the man of sin from being revealed. And the man of sin can't be revealed until we get caught up. It goes hand in hand. Okay. We're letting, we're preventing the man of sin from being revealed. And the man of sin can't be revealed till we get caught up. It goes hand in hand. I can keep going. But we did a whole study on that. You can go watch that uh, expository study we did on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But it's day of Christ. That's what it calls it. That's the actual title for us going up. That's what that day is called. That we're going to, It's the day of Christ. Now... What's the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord? Here's, without doing a huge study, we might do it in the, in the future, but without doing a huge study, you can do it yourself. The day of the Lord, the best way to do it is, the day of the Lord is equal to capital S, Son of Man, 
coming back to rule and reign of the Jews and the world, kingdom of heaven. It's the physical, earthly kingdom where God manifests in the flesh is going to come back, and he's from the, but the capital S son of man, he's come, going back to the line of David, and he's going to set himself up and rule and reign right? in Jerusalem. Right? That's the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back to take back that land that belongs to him, that belongs to the Jewish people, that belongs to him because he's their king, and he's going to end up ruling over the whole, whole earth. Day of the Lord. Uh, Matthew 10, 24 says, But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. There you hear you see, capitalist Son of Man. Son of Man be come. This is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, I believe. Because it got put off. He was talking about then. The prophecy of him first coming, it got put off. Now it goes to the second, uh, his second coming. At, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew 12, 8 says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. That's present tense. When he was there when his first coming. When he comes back, it's the, it, it's the same thing there. Capital S, Son of Man. I'm talking about him being king. A physical king over a physical kingdom. Matthew 12, 32, And what sort of speaketh the word against the Son, capital S, Son of Man, it shall be forgiven but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither the world to come. Now stop. One of the things we don't really talk about that much in this verse, without going off too much on a tangent, is the, uh, the par unpardonable sin. It's for today. It says, capital S, Son of Man. Jesus as a physical king ruling over a physical kingdom. He was there, present tense, to rule over a physical kingdom. He came as their king. So this applies then. It applies to when he comes back, the day of the Lord, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, to set up the day of the Lord, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. This would apply then. Is Jesus ruling and reigning down here on the earth, present tense? No. It doesn't apply to today. So people always try to apply that today. It doesn't say that the, um, the day of Christ, or I mean the capital S, Son of God, the spiritual kingdom. It's talking about the physical kingdom. When Jesus is physically present. Jesus is in heaven right now preparing a place for us. He's not physically present down here. But we see that again. Capital S, Son of Man. And it's referring to the physical kingdom. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Kingdom of heaven is always a reference to the physical kingdom. Now, the kingdom of God has two, there's two parts to the kingdom of God. Okay, I'm not going into this too much, but the kingdom of God, there's two parts. Physical, spiritual. Okay, and God helped us in the Bible. So, in Matthew, when it says kingdom of heaven, and then in Mark and Luke, it says kingdom of God, it's talking about the physical kingdom. Period. Then there's parts in John and, and all of it where it says kingdom of God, where it's not talking about the kingdom. You have to rightly divide 2 Timothy 2.15. Uh, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay. But you can do a word study on Son of Man versus capital S Son of Man versus capital S Son of God. Okay. Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, that spiritual kingdom where Jesus was forgiving sins. He had power to forgive sins. Okay. Then you have the Son of Man, where he's coming back, he's from the line of, King, of David, through Mary, he's, got, he's from the line of David, and he's there to rule and reign. He has authority okay. over the physical. Forgiving people's sins is over the spiritual. Son of Man is Jesus preaching the kingdom of heaven, physical kingdom, where the Son of God is talking about the spiritual kingdom. Okay. There's a distinction, you can do a study on that. Uh, the Old Testament, having the Holy Ghost which you can lose. Psalms 51.11 says, this is uh, King David, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And the New Testament, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. The point I'm making is in the Old Testament, okay, there's physical aspects to lose. You can lose the, Sp the Holy Spirit. Today, you can't lose the Holy Spirit, no matter how bad, how bad you fail the Lord. And I failed the Lord. 
I've, I've fallen flat on my face and I failed the Lord. Okay? But there's a distinction in the Bible. Okay? The Son of Man is, is for the time period where Jesus is going to be full here physically and he's trying to come in as their king and physically rule and reign on a, on a pr land that's promised to the Jewish people. Okay? And he's going to come back in the, king, in the day of the Lord, also known as the kingdom of heaven. There's a distinction. Holy, Old Testament, you can lose the, the Holy Spirit. Today, you can't lose the Holy Spirit. There's always distinctions, and you have to rightly divide 2 Timothy 2.15. Why is there a confusion between those days? The day of the Lord and the day of Christ. Okay. Well, one thing is, is there's a judgment. There's going to be a judgment. Okay. At, at the end of the kingdom of heaven, uh, there's a judgment. Uh, the day of Christ, after it happens, there's a judgment. And some people confuse this, the judgment seat. Now, on both days, okay, Jesus will come. That, uh, I, let's go to that one first, before we get into the judgment part. Jesus Christ is going to come on both days. And when they read something where Jesus is coming, they think, well, it's the same event. It's not. I'll show you where it sounds the same. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. The voice that God makes. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. The voice that God makes. Come up hither. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here's the difference. Okay. Both times, both events, Jesus is coming. So it's got to be the same event, right? Here's the difference. One, he's in the air. He never comes all the way down and touches down on earth. We go up to meet him. Okay. Revelation 9, 11. Revelation 9, 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he both judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had the name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in the vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word, capital W, Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He physically comes down and touches down and opens his mouth and wipes out that million man army. We go up at the day of Christ and meet him in the air. The day of the Lord, we come down with him, and he touches down, wipes out that 200 million men army, and he goes in to start the day of Christ, our day, our day of the Lord. He goes to start the day of the Lord, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. And he comes on both events, but how he comes is different, and the direction the body of Christ is going is different. One, we go up, the next one, we come down. What is the judgment seat? Acts 25.10 Okay, Acts 25.10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's... I just want to talk about where it talks about a what is a judgment seat. Acts 25.10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong as thou very well knowest. Okay. J uh, James 2.6. We want to jump over there to James 2.6. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Plural, but judgment seat. What is it? It's a place where someone is sitting down and, and the person in that, that's sitting down has the authority to judge. That's why it's called judgment seat. And today you have, um, in the courtroom, you have the judge has his seat up there where he at the very end, when the person's found guilty or not guilty, he's the one that passes judgment. Okay? There's always a seat. Now, both the day of the Lord and the day of Christ, there will be a day of judgment. John 5.22. John 5.22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow unto me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Everyone, both lost and saved, are going to have to give an account of himself to God. There's going to be a judgment. There has to be. Proverbs 3, 11, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be wary of his correction. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son of whom he delighteth. God will judge us present tense and correct us down here. He'll chasten us down here to get us on the right path. But there's going to come a day, brothers and Christ, where we're all going to have to account for our lives, period. If we're saved, we're going to have to account for our life as a Christian. But being part of the body of Christ, how we lived for Jesus Christ, how good of an ambassador for Jesus Christ we were. Okay? Being a verbal and living witness, both needs to be done. Today it's just verbal. Everyone's just all talk, 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 talk. What about the walk? Does your walk line up with this book? We're going to be judged on that one day. Okay? Uh, the lost world is going to have to come before the Lord and all their works, including their, lo their lost life, because they're just lost, their whole lost life, it's not washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. They're going to have to answer for it and it's going to be based off of works. We're going to be judged on their works as far as salvation. We're going to be judged on our works as far as rewards in heaven. How we get to spend eternity with God. Okay. One thing I put here on my notes though also, uh, for uh, the, the, the day of Christ, I have to correct myself and try to get myself to say it right, the true title, the day of Christ, where we get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. One thing it is, is it's, it's going to be a judgment on who's really saved and who's lost. I've heard brethren do great studies on that, and I believe it 100%. When we get caught up, the true bride of Christ, the true bride of Christ, we're going to get caught up, and you're going to see all these fakes and frauds left behind. Now, we as body of Christ, we can grab the Bible and say, hey, we can kind of see them, and we can point them out. But when we leave, God's going to be judging who's really saved and who's lost. We always read that verse that, um, I'm going to get to it right here, uh, 2 Timothy 2.19. Together, brothers of Christ, we always read this verse. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. It's a seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Those that are sealed into the day of redemption. God knows them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's the, hard, that's the hard part with this easy believism. They, they hate that. They, you know, that there's still going to be a judgment. Oh, no, we're, we're past judgment. No, you're not. No, you're not. There's still going to be a judgment. And here, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Here in America, mainly in America, but in the, probably all the, all the countries, but you have a lot of people who profess to be a Christian, and they justify sin, and they love sin. They love iniquity. They justify it. Who are you to judge me? Especially this false gospel of easy believism. Who are you to judge me? Paul says, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And please understand, when I say the false gospel of easy believism, I'm not saying you earn salvation with your works. I'm saying that the Bible teaches that you have to repent. You have to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross down here. Not have the head knowledge, but you have to believe in it. And repentance is you have to come to him broken, having sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against him. Sin is wrong. What God says is sin is wrong. I, I hate it. I don't want it in my life. I hate it. Lord, I, I can't get it out of my life. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell, and I deserve to go to hell. And then you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross here. You don't just have the head knowledge. You confess both in prayer and you ask God to save you. And the Bible teaches that after God saves you, which we're reading here, the Lord knoweth them that are His. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. There's a changed life. You're, you're pulled out. You're separate from the world. You're no longer looking like the world, acting like the world, talking like the world. You get pulled out of the world. But some brethren can fall back into it. Remember what we read? Being spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. You get pulled out of the world saying, hey, you're going to be separate. And we're going to read this here. That some brethren can fall back in. They can fall away. Okay. Giving heed to the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But in great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Departing from iniquity. Taking this book, hiding it in your heart, and living it. 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You have brethren that take heed to God's word, do things God's way, obey God's word, make sure their life lines up with this book. They're about pleasing God. But then you got some brethren that start falling back into getting distracted by the world. They take their eyes off Jesus Christ, they get distracted by the world. And it starts becoming about pleasing others, or pleasing me, myself, and I. They start indulging in wickedness and sin and worldliness. Flee also useful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. God knows them that are His. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of our Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. That's something we're, we need to really work on, brothers. Brothers in Christ that are in ministry, you need to really work on this, a lot of them. Even Peter Ruckman needed to work on this. Be gentle unto all men. Period. You can be stern and say this is absolute truth and be firm saying, I believe this, this is truth. But you need to watch out not becoming a jerk. Name calling, backbiting, whispering, bearing false witness. That always leads to a lot of things. The gossip, okay? That you become a talk show. A lot of ministries online lately, they're becoming a talk show. They're not preaching the word and being instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. They're not preaching the word as much as they are just talking to talk. Talk shows. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When you have someone that believes something that's wrong, and you have someone that's going the wrong direction, or you have someone in sin, they're doing something wrong, uh, iniquity, you correct them, but you do it in meekness. Gentle, you have to teach, you have to be patient, you have to be gentle, and you have to have meekness. You have to be firm. This is absolute truth. I'm not backing on it. What you're doing is wrong. Okay? Christmas is wrong. <laughs> You know, you have to be firm, but you don't start, you know, calling everyone out lost that, that celebrates Christmas. You don't start playing God and saying everyone's lost that's, that celebrates Christmas. Okay? There's times, we just read about this, that some are, dis, uh, are wood and earth, and some are dishonored. They, they dishonor the Lord. They do things wrong. They fail the Lord. Okay? Verse 26, And that they may recover themselves. Why do we do it this way? Why do you do... Um, and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You can always tell when brethren are starting to lose that focus of that desire and that heartfelt love for brothers and sisters Christ to see them recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, and they just have a lot of pride, and they're just, they're just throwing stuff on you to, to keep you down. They don't care what happens to you. They're just telling you that to tell you that because they're puffing themselves up, and they're up here, and you're down there. Okay, in meekness, they need to humble themselves and remember the whole point of instructing those that oppose themselves is that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive of him at his will. And that's what this study is. But we need to stick to the Bible and start doing, saying what the Bible has to say. I want to see you being... The snare of the devil is we can add to God's word as we see fit and we can subtract from God's word as we see fit. And it's not the word of God that matters, it's just the message. That's the snare of the devil. And I'm trying to help get you out of the snare of the devil and get back to pleasing God. Saying things God's way, believing what God says, and doing what God says. Matthew 25, 31. Turn to Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations. There's a throne. And he's going to be judging. So he judges from the throne in heaven. He's going to be judging from a throne down here. Once again, it's kind of like the separation of the spiritual versus the physical. And, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them of his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There's a judgment going on. The goats from the sheep. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Remember, the kingdom of heaven has to do with the time of Jacob's trouble, 
the day of the Lord, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, Satan's let loose for a little while, and then there's a judgment. And then a new heaven, a new earth is created, new Jerusalem comes down, and the kingdom that was the foundation of the world, the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So people need to get that 20, Matthew 24 and 25, it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. There's all these different parts in the kingdom of heaven. Right. And it goes all the way to the end, where there's a judgment, where God's, Jesus is going to be sitting on the throne. We read a little bit about this. And he's going to be rule. He's going to judge everyone. The day of Christ, those that are his, know who is truly saved versus those that are false brethren. Second part of the judgment. Okay, we just read there. We get caught up. We can know to a point. We can know. We can err on the side of caution where the Bible talks about how you can kick brethren that have become that wooden earth, that become a dishonor, that aren't doing right. We can kick them out of our fellowship so God will chastise them and, and, and get them back on the right path so they can come back in. But you put them out and you treat them as a, as a publican and a heathen as far as um, you don't fellowship with them. Just as we don't fellowship with the lost world, you don't fellowship with brethren that have fallen away. You put them out and say, hey, get your heart right with the Lord, get things lined back up here, and we can invite you back in. But they're still saved, they're still going up. But, there, but there's people we can look at out there and go, oh, wait a minute, they don't line up with this book at all. There's no changed life. In fact, they attack the real Jesus Christ of the King James Bible. They attack the true gospel of the King James Bible. They're okay with sin. They love sin. There's a difference between a brother getting into sin and, mix, and like I say, getting into it, choosing to sin, becoming part of the falling away. They still acknowledge it's wrong, but I'm still going to do it anyway. I, I can't stop. I, I want this. I choose this over fellowship with the brethren. You have brethren who chose Christmas over fellowship with the brethren, uh, post-trib over fellowship with the brethren, post and mid-trib, uh, false teachings, false uh, holidays, uh, worldliness, sin, you know, wickedness. You have people like Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games. You have people that chose that over fellowship with the brethren. You have people that fall away, but they still acknowledge that it's wrong. But then you have people that say, hey, there's nothing wrong with this, and they just, they're really against this book. Overall, they're really against what the book actually has to say. They can say they're Bible believers all they want, but they're actually against what it has to say. Those are false converts. We can determine false converts today through the scriptures, not through feelings and opinions. But ultimately, the day of Christ is going to be the old. That's when Jesus is going to be judging. There are going to be no more questions. Is this person saved? Is this person not saved? No more doubts. Jesus is going to make it very clear who was saved and who wasn't saved. The saved go up, the lost stay and remain and go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Romans 14.10 This is where we read about the judgment seat of Christ. We get caught up and then we get judged. Romans 14.10 But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. God knows them that are his. If we have to put someone out because that something doesn't doesn't, even if we don't think they're saved, something doesn't right, we just put them out of our fellowship and say, hey, get truly saved, get your heart right with the Lord, and you come back and we can invite you into our fellowship. Okay? That goes for those that we think aren't saved, those that we think are just falling away and getting really messed up. Regardless, you're out, you can come back in when you get your heart right with God. And if you're a false convert, you need to get truly saved and born again. It's the only way you're going to get your heart right with God. If you're truly saved, you need to get that sin and wickedness out of your life. You need to stop going the way of the world and, and pleasing the world and pleasing yourself. And that sin and wickedness, get it out so you can come back into our fellowship. Line up with the book. But we get caught up, there's going to be a judgment. And I keep pointing this out to the brethren, because a lot of brethren, I didn't know this as a false convert in these Babel buildings. Nobody ever taught me about there's going to be a judgment. Oh, you're free. God forgives you of all your sins and past, present, and future, and you're good to go. I was never taught consequences for sins today in this life. I was never taught that there's still going to be a judgment seat of Christ where we're going to have to answer for our life as a Christian. These are supposed to be motivators to fear, you know, um, uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in this life. Are having to stand before Jesus Christ, not working out your salvation as far as eternal security. I'm talking about your salvation in this life, how you're going to live down here, what you're going to be going through down here. The way, uh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. There's consequences to sin, physical consequences to sin, temporal consequences to sin down here. 
but the eternal consequences, if you're truly saved and born again, have been paid for. But there's still going to be a judgment. We're all going to be judged someday. At the day of, if the day of Christ happens, then it's the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So at the day of Christ, we get caught up. There's the judgment seat of Christ, and our works are being um, judged as a, our life as a Christian, so for rewards in heaven. At the kingdom of, hev uh, the kingdom of heaven, at the very end, uh, they're being judged on their works. Lost people are being judged on their works, and, and it has to do with salvation. You have to pass the law. You have to you have to completely keep the law in order to go to heaven. They're being judged whether or not they get to go to heaven. So that's the difference, brother says Christ. It's as easy as I can make it. Today, capital S, Son of Man, Kingdom of Heaven. Jesus comes down and he wipes out, the, we come down with him as the army. He wipes out the million man army. Remember the sword going out of his mouth? He goes in and rules and reigns. At, at the end of the day of the Lord, Satan's let loose for a season and there's going to be a judgment. And everybody, the whole death and hell are brought up. Mm -hmm. Revelation 20, 11. Okay, we're getting to that part. So we talked about us, the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. The day of Christ. Some things kind of go hand in hand. They kind of go together. Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne. There's a seat. And he that sat on him, on it, Jesus, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the, book of, in those, in the books, according to their works. According to their works. How we know it has to do with salvation. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Their, their, their salvation is based off of works. And, and that's what they're being judged on. We're, our works are being judged at the day of Christ. We get caught up. Our works are being judged, but it has to do with rewards in heaven. How we get to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Okay. There will be three judgments. The day of Christ, the day of the Lord. Okay, we just read that. When he comes back, he's going to be separating the goats and the sheep. When he comes back to set up his kingdom, there's going to be a judgment. And at the end of the kingdom of heaven, when the old heaven and the earth are done away with, we just read about that in Revelation 12, 11, there's going to be a, another judgment there. But once again, brothers and sisters Christ, why change the Word of God? Let's wrap this all up. I know we kind of went around here and there, but it's the day of Christ. It's not rapture. It's not the great tribulation. It's the day of Christ, and it's caught up, taken up, come up hither. These are the terms that God uses. Okay, not rapture. Why change all that? Why come in and say, well... Yea, hath God said a better rendering would be. I can improve on what God said. I can correct God. I can say it better. That's what it means to improve. And what God said was right. It was right. But I can improve on it. And when mankind tries to improve on it, guess what happens? They end up going against what God said. Every time. Mm -hmm. But why change it? Once again, it's to mess up everything, brothers of Christ, to make it, the body of Christ think they're going into the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what I'm realizing with a lot of these titles and these terms that are nowhere in scripture it has everything to do with trying to mess the brethren up to take them away from this to philosophy to false teachings that the body of christ goes into the time of jacob's trouble to confuse the differences between the day of christ and the day of the lord there are some similarities jesus comes but remember day of christ he doesn't touch down day of christ we go up day of the lord he touches down Day of the Lord, we come back with him after we are judged at the judgment seat of Christ. After the time of Jacob's trouble, towards the end, we come back with him. Okay? There are differences, but they try to hide those differences. And the number one way they try to mess up the word of God is by changing it. Well, we're going to change the title. We're going to change the title to the Great Tribulation. Uh, no, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, we're going to change caught up 
and um, you know, caught up, uh, taken up, come up hither. We're going to say rapture, right? And we're going to take away, and 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 we're not even going to use the title for the that God uses. We're not even going to call it the day of Christ. Brothers says Christ, I want to be honest with you. In all my teachings, Peter Ruckman, Brian Denlinger, when it was King James Video, when it was King James Video Ministries, it was about preaching the word, not the world. Um, not a talk show. It was actually a Bible study, a solid, hardcore, sat down for an hour comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture, letting the Bible define the Bible, using the Bible as an example for the, what you're talking about. A good, when it was that, even then, he hardly said Day of Christ. Uh, Peter Ruckman hardly just said it. I'm looking into this, I'm saying, people who preach that we go up before the time of Jacob's trouble, they hardly call it the day of Christ. And yet, that's what the Bible calls it. That's the actual title for it. And I'm going to try to work on it. Please forgive me, and by all means, uh, help me. You know, if I end up keep saying, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, and I don't say day of Christ with it, day of Christ. What is the day of Christ? It's where the body of Christ gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's the day of Christ. We need to get back to saying things God's way. To confuse the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. That's why they keep changing things in the Bible. That's why they keep changing t uh, titles, uh, uh, descriptions, uh, terms, words. They're trying to make them one and the same. Post and mid-trib try to make the day of Christ and the day of the Lord the same thing. Satan is always trying to get the body of Christ distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble and the signs that will now that will not show up till then. Okay, we can see how things are falling away. There's wars and rumors of wars. Okay, there's some prophecies that let us know that these things are going to happen no matter what happens. Keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep looking for that blessed hope. But you have brethren today that are ignoring those prophecies and grabbing the prophecies that have to do with what is the time of Jacob's trouble. And they're getting the brethren to look for those prophecies, to look for those signs. The mark of the beast, the one world order, the one world currency, uh, the one world religion, okay, um, and stuff like that. They're trying to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ and on the world. And that's what I'm realizing too with a lot of this changing things, is to get our eyes the, looking at the wrong thing. It's to get us to start living for the wrong thing, because there are brethren out there that are living, preparing themselves for the time of Jacob's trouble. They really are. They believe we get caught up before it, they say it, but their life reflects that they're not living for Jesus Christ today. They're living like they're trying to get ready to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They keep looking for it. Don't get distracted by it. Okay? Brother says Christ, ultimately, with these series of studies, is that People are changing the Word of God to get our eyes off Jesus Christ and living for Him today and being an ambassador for Jesus Christ today. They're getting us to think we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble or looking, even if we believe, I don't believe we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble, then why are you looking for it? That's what I always I want to ask the brethren. They're taking their eyes off Jesus Christ. They no longer believe that the day of Christ is at hand, that Jesus, that He might redeem us from this wicked world that we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, okay, they've taken their eyes off of it, and they say, well, I don't believe we're going to that time period. Then why are you looking for it? You're looking for it because you in your heart believe you're going through it. I'm not going through it. I'm getting caught up before it. So what am I looking for? The catching away, the day of Christ, where we're going to get caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to live for. And that's what the brethren are failing today. They're not living for that anymore. There's that side of it. The other side of it is you have brethren thinking that I just look for that blessed hope and God will solve all my problems. Uh, no. I'm talking about your sins, your wickedness, you're not doing things God's way, you've made a mess of your life, everything's falling apart because of the bad decisions you've made. You need to come to God looking for that blessed hope and get your heart with, right with God and let God clean up your life now while we're still here. There's those people, oh, I'm just looking for that blessed hope. Uh, if you're really looking for it, then you're cleaning up your life and you're living a life of Christ. And they're liars. I'm looking for it, and they're just making a huge mess. And you have some brother, like I said, Peter Ruckman, I disagree with him on this. He used to tell people, oh, you're, you're in bankruptcy, or, you know, this is happening, or that's happening. Oh, God, just keep looking for that blessed hope. It'll solve all of your problems. No, because then you're going to have to answer for it at the judgment seat of Christ. Owe no man anything. Okay. 
You're going to be, have to answer for that bankruptcy. You're going to have to answer for those sins. You're going to have to answer for not doing things God's way. You're going to have to answer for how you've been treating your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to have to answer for how you've been treating the lost world, being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're going to have to answer for those things. The, catch, the, the day of Christ is not a solution to all your problems, your personal problems, like your walk with Lord not being right. It'll save us from this wicked world. Praise God. Absolutely. This wicked world. That he might redeem us from this wicked world. But you have those two groups of people. Okay, you got the people that are actually looking for the time of Jacob's trouble and living like they're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble because that's what they're looking for. You have people over here that are just living however they want to live and say, I'm looking for that blessed hope that's going to solve all my problems and I don't have to worry about living a life of Christ. And there's very few of us that are, that are standing right where we're looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. We're not over there, and we're definitely not over there. I'm not looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. I'm not looking for the mark of the beast or the mark of the beast technology. I'm not looking for the one world order. I'm not looking for the one world uh, religion. Okay, the one world. I told you what the one world Bible is. It's it's no, it's not an actual book that you can hold in your hand. The one world holy scriptures is a message, is a is a it's philosophy, and the philosophy is the message matters, not the word, not the actual written word. It's the message. And that's going to be, I, that's what I believe, but, you know, I'm not looking for that. I can see that today. People are already straying from this. It's no longer the word that matters. It's the message. And we see that. Brothers and Christ, stick with the word of God. Stick with the perfect written word of God. And continue to live for him every day. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Okay? How? By looking for that blessed hope. That day of Christ. Right? Where it's a blessed hope, that blessed hope where we're going to be caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. And if you're looking for it, you have the understanding that there's going to be a judgment seat, and we're going to be judged. So when we're looking for it, we're trying to clean up, we're trying to get our hearts right with God, we're trying to please God, sin doesn't please God, worldliness doesn't please God. Um, we need to start living for, for the Lord. Right? So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, and my love for you, brothers and sisters Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to see you... Pick back up. Remember what we read there where it said, uh, where you get down by Satan and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God permit, give them fresh, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus, I want to see you recover yourself out of the snare of the devil. Doctrines of devils. Rapture, doctrine of devils. The great tribulation, doctrine of devils. Okay. Post mid trib, doctrines of devils. Okay, people getting you distracted and looking for the time of Jacob's trouble at the doctrine of devils. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble itself isn't, but getting you to look for it and, and start living your life as if you're going to go through it. That's the doctrine of devil. We're supposed to be living our life as if Jesus Christ could call us home any day now. We're supposed to be living for him. We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and thank you for following along in your King James Bibles. And I will see you in the next study.